two, three, four. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to introduce the next speaker at the uh, Great Ohio Preparedness and Self-Reliance Expo of 96. My name is John Statmiller. I'll be introducing the host of the Intelligence Report on WWCR. Uh, and well, most of you folks in this audience know who this man is. Undeniable, most sought after, and probably one of the people in this movement today that has done so much for so many people. Without getting real wordy here, because we are limited on time, I would just like to remind folks that we are up on shortwave. There's been some changes in scheduling and frequency, so the times for the shortwave program on WWCR, the Intelligence Report, is Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the preceding hour is carried on 9.955 shortwave out of Miami, Florida, from 7 to 8 p.m., and it's also on satellite. Galaxy 7, Transponder 14, and the audio is 7.71. I think in the next few months you're going to see some interesting things happen in the media as far as the Patriot community is concerned and getting the word out. So uh, this is going to play a part in it. Well, having said all that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mark Kornke. Educational process 
This is the last place I expected to be in 1996 if you talked to me in 1976. And that's a fact. I didn't, I was, I guess I had a better, a better outlook on government in general, what our people in Washington were doing, and what the puppeteers were doing behind the string, behind the scenes, even though I didn't know there were puppeteers at the time per se. We knew that there were probably evil men out there plotting, but we didn't exactly understand the overall program. Well, that was 20 years ago. And like all of you that are sitting here, each one of us has had to walk a different path that has taken us to 1996 and truly, truly a new world order. Oh, I'm sorry, I just love to do that every once in a while. But of course, now, they'll claim and tell you that there is no new world order. Well, but they're, well, they're not using the words now. But Major General Sheehan last year, even while they were making these claims, sat down in uh, Louisiana at Fort Polk and used those very words less than a year ago. Behind closed doors and in places where the ring knockers feel safe, they're continuing to use the same phraseology and the same terms. But something has happened, and that something is the Patriot Movement. The mistake that's been made, and we've gone over this several times this weekend, but most of you, it really has to be driven in before you leave here. Most people do not fully understand the strength and the power of the Patriot Movement. We are virtually in every state of the Union. We are across the entire nation. We are in the courts. We are in the legislatures. Quietly, we are in law enforcement. Quietly, we are in schools. Not so quietly as you might think, but we're not going to get any media coverage on this. You're not going to see this on ABC, NBC, or CBS if they can help it. We have been so successful that for a change, consider this. The other side has had to change their vocabulary. Do you realize how important that is? Because normally, if they were the all-seeing New World Order, like the Borg, well, then they wouldn't have to change anything at all. All-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, they should be able to continue with the track that they're already on, shouldn't they? But they have actually had to change or hide the words that they've been using to protect themselves from the evidence that has been presented to the people, and that even as we speak is still going out to the people. Consider this, all of you are at a certain level right now, some of you are probably new, but many of you are already at different de to, diff to a different degrees, fairly knowledgeable about what's going on in America. Many of the people that you become frustrated with are at a level that is almost, uh, almost barring on ignorance, wouldn't you say? Well, how could this happen? Why could this take place? But, unlike two or three years ago, almost everybody you talk to, as I've heard many people say and verify from their direction, people aren't laughing anymore. It's not funny anymore. They may, of course, try to be in a state of denial, but in the back of their mind already, they know, meaning the general population, no matter who it is, that something is not right that maybe it's the economy from their perspective, maybe it's the fact they've seen something in law enforcement that they heard from one of your voices, and that has given them a chance to, to change the perspective on how they look at what's taking place in America. Even though they tried to bury him, Michael New got out into the press, didn't he? Even though they tried to bury it, it took four going at almost five years but we've got somebody who's pleaded guilty to murder in Idaho. Think about that. That did not happen because of the couch potatoes. That did not happen because Dan I'd rather, and as John says, Connie Chunk, decided that they were gonna do something. They didn't. It's not those people in the controlled media that kept the pot stirred and kept the fire under their hind end. It is you that kept the fire under their hind end, and they cannot walk away from it now. So if they can't stop it, and these are a basic rule about, about martial arts, boxing, any kind of battlefield condition. Think about this. If you can't stop a punch, you deflect a punch. So all of a sudden, we've got a federal agent who just pled guilty. I think Cahoe is, is the guy's name. 55 years old, he's a veteran of the FBI. Oh, oh! you'll notice in the press they now say he's an ex-FBI agent. Why? To cover their hind end before he was prosecuted, or persecuted maybe, because it's just one guy, 
What they did is they threw him out intentionally. That way the wording is appropriate. Oh, he's ex-FBI. Well, let me ask you something. If the Weaver murders and the Waco massacre and the Oklahoma bombing took four and three and two years to properly put in perspective for the American people, ladies and gentlemen, what was this guy doing for the last four years before they threw him out? He was getting a pat on the head, a warm tummy, and an attaboy from the Clinton administration for doing good work butchering men, women, and children in America. Only because they got caught with their arm in the cookie jar all the way up to their armpit, and because we kept the pressure up, we meaning all of us, did they finally decide that maybe it would be a good idea to throw someone to the wolves. Now, let me put this in perspective. If one of you right now left this room, went home, and were suspected, suspected of being involved in some periphery way in a murder, do you think you'd be charged with one count of something? How many people have watched when people get picked up? If you've dealt with the court, you know this. Some of you people have been in the courts, so you know it firsthand. You don't get charged with one of anything. They throw 10, 15, or 20 charges on you, and then, well, we'll take this out. How do you feel now? Will you accept that? Oh, we'll take this out now. How do you feel? Will you accept that? Oh, wait a minute. We'll just take a little more out. It's an old communist joke, by the way. I'll explain it in a minute. With these characters that are with the Fed, it's one charge. Oh, now he's going to plead guilty. This is part of the deflection process. Oh, it wasn't the whole nest. It was just one snake that was bad. They're all rattlesnakes. It's just this snake that bit this time that you caught. So we're going to offer up one of the little puppies. We're going to offer up one of the little kids. Well, the problem is this. How is it that they decided that they could do it at, at uh, Ruby Ridge what they did? How is it that the New World Order, oh, oh, I'm sorry, our government, decided that it could get away with Waco? There was a mindset, not only in the rank and file, because that's not where the command is, ladies and gentlemen, there was a mindset throughout the entire administration and mechanism that gave the wink and the nod to do this. Do not give these people any benefit of any doubt. The moment you do that, you are playing into their game. These people are evil, they are murderers, and they're desperate to stay out of their very own system because, I will tell you this, you're not going to get any relief for justice with it. If the actual perpetrators are brought before this court system, they will break their own rules to make sure that they stay out of jail because this was a planned agenda. This was intentional. Now, where can they go with this? Well. Despite what they're trying to claim, let, let me walk back through the past here. Remember when the Weaver case first took place, what they did inside the FBI is they had the Inspector General check things out. What did he say? Nothing was wrong. We kept the fire up, and about eight months later, oh, the FBI decided they had to do another investigation. They did it themselves again. Guess what? They found, once again, no problem. Our pet, our pet Rottweiler didn't go bad. He's okay. Okay? Now, then they went to the third investigation. Oh, that's right, there was a third one. And this time around, well, there may have been, in other words, they were testing the water to see how stupid we are. They tested the water and said, well, there was a little indiscrepancy here, but there was no crime committed. That was almost three years ago. Actually, two and a half years ago. Well, finally, we got something stirred up. They couldn't let it go. We kept the pressure up. We, meaning the Patriot Movement, certainly not the mass media. And all of a sudden, right before everybody's eyes, we're going to have some Senate hearings. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that should tell you that that's mass, that is, that's mass media deflection. And even that has not worked. The fire has not been quenched. People are still disgusted with it. But yet, a slap in the face is even as supposedly they were having these hearings, what did they do with all the murderers who were involved? Bill Clinton gave them letters of commendation after they thought it was safe and gave them all a pat on the head in the promotions. Now, I'm going to challenge you to something. It took us four to five years to get this before the American people. Every man that was involved at Ruby Ridge was involved in the massacre at Waco. Period. Make no mistake about it, these baby butchers are only being tapped right now for something that happened four and a half years ago. 
the murders that took place at Waco, and I'm not trying to trivialize what happened with the Weavers. By comparison, ladies and gentlemen, you're talking the difference between a cup of tea and a coffee pot. The difference in volume is, is catastrophic at best. The only reason, the only reason the next event did not take place as scheduled beyond Waco is again because of you. First seeing the Weaver situation develop, then going to Waco with where it, where it obviously ended, the American people were now waking up in general again with this thought in the back of their head here, something's wrong. How many of you woke up when Waco took place? I'm just, be honest too. That was enough, wasn't it? Anybody, here's the problem I had with this myself, and this is the frustration, because I know I, I can fight well, but when that happened, for almost all of the Patriot movement who had been following this, I can, I can imagine exactly what was going on in your mind, because people had just eaten breakfast, or some were just getting up. You get to turn on the television, munch on your kicks, and watch a church full of people burn to death in America. You cannot soften that, you cannot lighten it, you cannot do anything to change it because the image is indelibly printed now in the United States. Somebody said before, and I'll, bring, I'll clarify this, all the while afterwards, for the two years, almost that it took, for us to get the point across that Waco is bad, it was inevitable that the government would have to commit themselves to an Oklahoma-type atrocity for the same reason I described earlier. If you cannot stop a punch, you must deflect the energy and take advantage of it. That is why the government perpetrated the Oklahoma bombing. The 19th of April had become and still is a rally cry for Americans to demonstrate, first of all, what we were able to accomplish on April 19th when the American Revolution started, and also to demonstrate why we have a need to clean house 200 years plus later with what happened at Ruby Ridge and with what happened in Waco. The government spin doctors and the ring knockers, the symbolists, had to turn the situation around. Now there were accusations, well how would you know? Logic dictates. There's sim these people dwell and live in the world of symbolism. It was inevitable that an incident like Oklahoma would take place with the government because they had no choice but to try and do a radical surgery to turn the situation around. We can debate details all day, but we have enough facts and we can demonstrate with enough first-hand information, since we were in the middle of the storm, to tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt the government did it. And all of the evidence that is pointing to it now demonstrates they're trying desperately to put the trial farther and farther out. Why? Not because they don't have all the evidence. Remember, the government controlled all the evidence. They are fearful that the people of America will see all of the facts and they are trying to spread it out, hopefully creating a conflict beforehand or perhaps something happening in government that will ensure nobody ever has to look at that case. Were we told the trial was supposed to take place in January? Yep. Then July? Yep. Oh, by the way, it was going to happen in October. Oh, that's right. This is November what? Third and farther out, and many other events like this have taken place around the country and they're trying the same thing. Fabrication. Now that gets into our issue about the controlled media. Let me point something out, and there was a conflict here, but I, there is no doubt in our mind, my mind, we've got the facts straight. This latest thing that happened in Virginia, how many know that my name is Ray Looker? <laughs> That's right, I'm an imposter. I am not who I thought I was. Oops. Well. It should not surprise anybody that the series of events took place the way it did. An overview. Rule number one, symbolism. If you don't think it's there, let me explain something. Have you ever noticed how when all these incidents take place, no two incidents ever take place in the same region? Have you ever asked yourself that? When we had all these mass murderers that, if you notice, we haven't had for a while again. Almost like somebody shut a switch off. We had all these mass shootings at post office, etc. After the first three, those shootings were very predictable. And what we did is sat down and actually were able to identify how they were going to take place. Rule number one, no two regions are ever hit the same in the same place twice. And these, uh, these operatives always work points of the compass. This can be demonstrated simply by watching the events as they take place. Now take a look at what happened just recently with these incidents with the militia. Macon, Georgia, Arizona, Washington State, 
Oh, by the way, now we're going to go back over to the East Coast, West Virginia. Now, don't you think, with all the people in the Patriot Movement, that at least one of these incidents would be close together, like one on top of the other? Not once has that been the situation. That demonstrates how these situations first have been fabricated, developed, and then implemented by the operatives on the other side. Excuse me, on the other side. With that in mind, well, let's see. They've gone south, they've gone west, they've gone east. Can I put myself out on a limb and tell you that the next incident will be in the north and be inaccurate? Well, sorry to say, I'd say, and, and maybe we'll screw it up, but I don't think so. Number one, the other side, as I said before, it's like the Borg. It's futile to resist, you will be absorbed. Their own minions are in trouble. <laughs> You can't keep the confidence level up when you keep stumbling and you're supposed to be omnipotent and all-knowing. So the next step is they have to stick with the agenda. They have to stick with the program at least to a certain degree. If something happens in the north, one of the things that is also known is it's not going to be like any other part of the country. Make no mistake about that. We aren't exactly uh, ambivalent to the idea of black shirts showing up at 3 in the morning, are we? It's not a really good idea. They'll be back out on the streets, or they'll be somewhere else very quickly, but they aren't going to be in your house, they're not going to be on your land, not going to be on your property. But in the meantime, we have a series of strategic events that may help to cloud this situation for a little bit. One of them is obviously in two days we have an election. Somebody asked me, who would you, oh, who would be the better choice? Who could we find? There is no better choice. I think everybody understands that at the strategic level with the presidency. I was told by different pundits about a year ago, oh, we have nothing to worry about because during an election year, they'll never talk about gun control because they'll be worried about the votes. At the Republican National Committee, Bob Dole flat out told all of you that he is going to implement national firearms registration for all weapons in the United States. Didn't he? I'd say that's pretty blatant, straightforward in your face. Now the Clintonistas, on the other hand, are just doing what they've always done. And in fact, what fascinated me, they brought up all the puppets, all the corpses that they tried to use in the first two years and pulled them out. And we had the health care bill right in your face with Christopher Reeves in a wheelchair as your best, as the poster boy for this month and for the event. And then we had Sarah, yes, I want your guns, Brady out there in front of everybody, doing exactly what they did three years ago. Exactly. No difference. Almost as if they took a cartridge, <laughs> blew it off, and plugged it right back in. Now, I would say all of you did a pretty good job of fighting. We stopped and butt cold, didn't we? Guess what? The battle's right back in your face, and it's the exact same issues all over again as if they've been told it makes no difference what losses we took before and it makes no difference if it's even legal they are going to execute the actions anyway and firearms are going to be the pivot because bottom line is that as coercive force being wielded by the population nobody in government that has ever been just has ever been fearful of the population armed only tyrants are afraid of an armed population. Only people who are criminals or are going to commit criminal acts are afraid of the population that supposedly they're governing over, although that's not the term they use nowadays, is it? In their case, they'll say they're ruling, and that term by itself should be repugnant to all of us. Well, if they're governing, they have nothing to fear. If it is their intention to usurp their power and become a tyrant, they have a great deal to fear from us and from many Americans, many of which may not even know what the heck's going on when the battle starts. Now, I hope you all caught the phrase I just used here. It is not an if, it is a when. If there is any doubt in your mind, and I have seen this again for the last, in the last many months, it's not, there's a hesitancy because the tangibility, the reality of this situation is setting in. It's not that it hasn't happened in the past, but because of your individual experiences, it is difficult to relate to just how in your face or how close the situation has become at different times. And one of the other things is, well, we survived several catastrophic events, we meaning the Patriot Movement and America in general. Unfortunately, we then soften our memory. And because it isn't as crisp and right there before you, we can let it rest for a bit. There is no rest and there is no compromise. 
if I've heard this once for you people, I've asked if this question was, has been asked probably a hundred times. How is this going to start? Well, and somebody says, well, if you had a crystal ball. We don't have a crystal ball. That's not my job. But as an intelligence analyst, I was taught to use a series of analytical processes to come up with specific results taking the data and input that we have on hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the other side has very few places left it can go. Let me point something out. Haven't we done a good job of lifting rocks? What I referred to earlier is the best example. We now have a federal agent who finally, after four years, has been burned. The rocks have all been lifted to the point where they have no place left to take this but to the courts. Now, with that in mind, and knowing that with Ruby Ridge, the litigation bomb, oh, that's right, the court, the court situation is such that the government themselves have settled the price for a victim. The price for a victim in these cases is $1.1 million because each of the survivors received $1.1 million for each of the P4, each of the survivors of those family members that were murdered. If that is the case, let me walk through the next step. If we keep the pressure up and if the government wants to accept this, at Waco, how many people died? Oops. With that number multiplied by how many grandmothers, how many grandfathers, how many sisters, how many uncles who are going to say, that was my favorite relative, and I think you need to pay. You're not talking $3 million here. You're talking hundreds of millions of dollars here. Do you think that Uncle Samuel and the Federal Reserve from overseas is going to want to pay out hard resources that right now they're strapped in every other category to give out? They're already having a problem with this toilet flush called the Federal Reserve. Right now, it's to the point where it's so tight, the head can see the tail. That means it's getting ready to go. And think about it, it's like this room right here, it's like musical chairs. When this Ponzi scam was set up, there were lots of chairs, so when you kick somebody out, not everybody noticed. But like a toilet flush, as you take more chairs out, <clears throat> Those people that are left do not want to be left without a chair. Now consider this. You realize we have the capability to take the chair before they get a chance to sit in it and the other side knows it? T traditionally, the Ponzi scam is set up so the guy who's organized it is never left without. But in this case, <clears throat> we've done enough education that the other side knows there are many people out there who can get out of the trap who are going to sidestep the trap. If that's the case, then they're the people left standing when the time comes, and the other side is terrified of this. The New World Order, call them whatever you want to, the guys that are on the other side, the, the dark side of the force. There we go. Well, where can they go with this now? If they can't hide from Ruby Ridge, and they can't hide from Waco, the next step is also to ask, how long can they hide Oklahoma? When you go to Oklahoma, it is a, it's an interesting split. It's about like the American Revolution. And all of you are worried about this vast majority of people that are supposed to rise up. Let me explain something. That did not happen in the American Revolution. It is not going to happen this time around. If you ex expect perfection, then obviously you haven't dealt with human beings long enough. You're not going to get exactly what you want, and there's no date, for instance, that we're going to be able to choose. One of the reasons is because of the random factor that develops with more people being involved. The only option is eventually for the enemy, the New World Order crowd, the court system, whatever, the only option they have is to violate their own laws. They are going to throw out their own rule books. And many of our people who have been fighting in the courts, who are very adept, who have won hundreds and thousands of cases, will come forward privately and tell you that the other side is constantly breaking the rules now. But think about this. They wrote the rules. Obviously, yet again, like all the other stones that we've overturned, we did something right. Now, I just got into discussion over this. There we go. I just got in a discussion over this. One of the points is, how many people understand that the one of the reasons the Declaration of Independence came about, and one of the reasons that the Revolution came about, is because the people who are in administration, who are in the Patriot Movement, did their job too well. 
Does everybody understand that when books were being brought into the colonies, the lawyers could not get to the docks fast enough because the patriots got there first and bought the law books and were able to understand the law by studying it. And when they went into the courts without the black robe and without the wig, they were beating the snot out of all of the king's lawyers. We've seen this happen today. We have people that are incredibly competent, some of the best minds that I've seen in the country, who can walk into a courtroom and do not have to have notes. They can recite the law. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about legalese, we're talking about the law. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what was happening in 1773, 1774, and 1775, right up into where we had to pull the trigger to fight. But here's something that's interesting that you're all going to have to learn and all of our administrators or people who are involved in this are going to have to learn that haven't yet. If you're a militiaman, if you're involved in the Patriot Movement, and if you're thinking of fighting, you must be balanced and well-rounded and be willing and, and must be capable of understanding our form of government, good law, and how to administer it. Why? because I may not be the one to make it to the end of this, and all these other adept professionals or semi-professionals who do know the law may not make it to the end of this. So whoever gets to the finish line has to make sure that our victory counts. The other side knows this. The New World Order crowd realizes that once you understand the rules of the game, no matter how perverted they are, you're now on an even playing field. There's not a court we can't go into that we don't understand. There's not a legislature that we can't go into that we don't understand. There's not an avenue of expertise that the Patriot Movement has not perfected itself and understands completely and can operate in. We can swim in those waters. If for any other reason, that is why we will have to fight. Because as I said before, when you keep lifting the stones up, ladies and gentlemen, where do they have left to run? After Waco, after Ruby Ridge, after Oklahoma, after we start litigating or as we see them in the courts where they're losing, they have no place to go and they will panic and use coercive force to terrorize and threaten the American people, specifically us. That's why, just as you must be adept in government, you must also be adept at the capability to wield coercive force for defense. Now, you have nothing to apologize for. How many of you people live here in the state of Ohio or in one of the 50 states? Well, gee, I think that's all of us. Any of you go out of your way to go hunting down the New World Order overseas? Who invaded any countries lately? You've been involved in any occupation forces? No, no, and no. There's an old, there's a, there's an old line, everybody knows the movie Red Dawn, and most people don't think about this because they kind of slide over it. Where, this, where, they, where they've captured a Russian soldier and the one kid's asking, what's the difference between us and them? What's the difference between us and them? And he turns around and goes, click, click, we live here, they don't. Boom. That is as simple as it gets. You live here, they don't. The forces of the federal government are an occupation element at this time that is made up for the most part of globalists people who have no ambition to see the Constitution and Bill of Rights preserved or survive. That's it. With, with that in mind, then you have to acknowledge the fact that the only defenders left are the people the document was meant for, you, the American people of the many states of these United States. Period. Again. Abbreviated. Now that we've gotten that far, then you have to accept a responsibility. These types of words are not words that the New World Order crowd will use. Have you noticed that? Watch all the publications that are on the other side. Power. Manipulate. Control. Wait a minute, I'm a little confused here. I seem to recall the words responsibility, authority, governance, statesman. Being involved, but understanding that you are a custodian responsible to ensure that the republic is preserved. And it is a republic, isn't it? Yes. All we need to do is go to the documents which they will not acknowledge they're trying to destroy, and you need only read it to demonstrate the treason and the actions of sedition on the part of people in government to destroy our form of government. 
The first question we have to ask then is, well, where can they go with this? Well, we already saw this with a case earlier with Michael New, didn't we? They've got to try and go for the enforcement arm. And the enforcement arm includes the U.S. military. Michael New did stand up. There's been some situations afterwards that have developed, and that's a personal issue with him. But he did stand up, and he did resist appropriately. My only problem is they didn't, they didn't take the argument correctly, and here's where the mistake has been made again. Defense is acceptable unless you know that the enemy is committing a criminal act. And then it is your duty, your obligation as a soldier or as a sovereign, not a citizen, to point out and to implement and execute law against the perpetrators. Any officer who acknowledged the order for U.S. soldiers to, to take off their American insignia and don a foreign national insignia have committed an act of treason and sedition in a direct violation of their oaths. They should be punished appropriately and they can be. Think about that. Now, does that mean that lowly private or that spec four can do it? Yes, they can. And the colonel who is his lawyer knows this too. And I'm a little confused. When an officer steps forward, he swears an oath of allegiance to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. He's to protect the Constitution and the Bill of Rights from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. If that officer violates any aspect of the Constitution or his oath, then automatically he has, act, he has committed an act of treason. He is an oath breaker. That is not too harsh a word. Now let me give you an example, and I, I've got it right here. I'm going to show you something. Oh, I hope I have it here. I do this sometimes. There we go. I need these pictures back, and I can trust you people, so I'm going to ask somebody to carry this out. And we got to pass it quickly. This is not a uh, specious line of thought, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> these are a picture of the tanks at Waco taken by local law enforcement that you did not see in the press. Now, here's the point. Everybody, how many people have been in the military? Okay, right. Remember, you can delegate your authority, but not your responsibility, right? They drill that into your head every chance they get. I can give you the authority, I, I, but I'm still responsible for you. How many have been in the military, been in supply? Well, if you know what's going on, what I'm going to bring up here, the officer in charge signs for everything, doesn't he? When an officer who is in charge of your company, your battalion, your regiment takes over, the old officer, the officer who is transferring command, walks with him through the entire building and the entire facility and checks everything. Why? Because the company, oh, you know something? Company, like corporate, a military company, that's where this really does apply. The company commander is responsible for all those individuals who signed under him. At Waco, those armored vehicles were signed for by a unit commander, a battalion commander, a brigade commander, and the division commander. If they violated any federal laws, it's not the grunt that's first responsible for the action. It is the officer in charge. Now, let me show you something. When you look at this picture, look at the Abrams tanks and notice that they took green tape, duct tape, and covered over every serial number and all of the nomenclature on these vehicles. Do you want to know why? Because we've taken the wrong angle in some ways and I've tried to plant this seed everywhere. The officer who gave those tanks away immediately committed a felony the moment he handed them over to any agency because he is personally responsible for the equipment. That's why those numbers had to be covered up because any photographs would have demonstrated the guilt of the officer in charge. By taking him to task and taking him to court, the next man in line is then responsible too because somebody answers to someone. The next man in line is responsible also because he assigned the guy the job. And it makes no difference if he says, well, I didn't know. You should have known. Isn't that the first thing they tell you when they pick you up? What's that word we hear in court? Ignorance is no excuse under the law. Now the point being, these officers, yep, and yes, and the pyramid. Well, with the issue being the way it is here, ladies and gentlemen, again, if I'm wrong, then why cover the numbers up in the first place? It's like, oh, that's a simple thing. Well, good. Then why was the tape put on there? 
Why did they assign somebody the task of going up and going around and making sure that absolutely no identifier is available? Because we are absolutely correct, and I won't back down on this at all. But this demonstrates criminal culpability. If we can demonstrate it here, how many actions have they performed that we have not seen? Because remember, it's like cockroaches and rats. If you see one incident, you got 20 more you haven't seen or heard of yet. And may never because they're good about burying the evidence, aren't they? Oh, I'm sorry. Or burning it down and shoveling it into a hole. Or in Oklahoma, after it supposedly was attacked, blowing it up, digging a hole, throwing all the evidence in it, and covering it with a slab of cement, and telling everybody you don't need to know what happened. Gee, we carry this to its ultimate extreme. And the next question that all of you have asked me is, when is enough enough? Well, here's the problem with that part of the scenario. We are in a defensive posture, but we aren't going to be defensive forever. At one point or another, at some time or another, it could be one of you, it might be me, it could be one of these other people that's out here that's spoken. Somebody is going to be attacked, and there is going to be no discussion about the issue. I'm going to openly say this, I'm not going anywhere with anybody short of being utterly surprised and taken so far off guard that I'm not silly and can't function, can't do anything. And even then, the moment I wake up, don't be within arm's reach. If all I have left are teeth to work with, then that's the weapon I'll use. But all of you have to take this mindset when facing your enemy. Now, I described this several times, it's like being, in a, it's being a knife fighter. If you think it's cool to be a knife fighter, you know what the first thing you got to get out, out of your head is? It's neat to have that knife, and it's one thing to carry it or to have it on hand, but it's another thing to be willing to get so close you can smell the other guy's bad breath and be willing to accept the idea that he can cut you just as easily as you can cut him. That's how it works. Until before you get into that mindset, you accept the idea that you're going to get hurt, then you are going to have immediately a battlefield hindrance. You are going to be handicapped. We have to change our mindset. And the first rule is, again, I apologize for nothing. This is a free nation. I'm an American. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a, a sovereign from the state of Michigan, or Michigan State, if appropriately worded. And I know what my rights are. And I am a free person. I am a free man. I am not going to surrender that. And if I have to fight to keep it, I have no reason to apologize for it. Period. I wanted to get this last night, and this is something that ties into this, because there have been people all through our history that have stood and had to stand at these crossroads. Fortunately, we've been able to pass through them on occasion. In some ways, I would say unfortunately. Some of you guys are gray-haired, which means you looked a little more like me a few years ago, and I'm going to look a lot more like you probably in a, few, in a short year if things keep going the way they are. The situation that developed could have been stopped at any time. If right from the beginning, as I said very early on, we in the Americas had perceived our strength, some people ask me, well, well, really, will it get that bad? It has, the, the enemy knows that they have no, cha no choice but to follow this path out. If that's the case, it is inevitable that we fight. But wouldn't we have been better off when we had been stronger before this next generation had appeared? Wouldn't we have been better off resisting then? Probably, we would have because this generation would not have been sacrificed to the New World Order the way it has been and would not require the effort and the work that it's going to take to bring back up and online. The event that's taking place right now in, in America with the latest generation of young, young men and women or children that are out there, and we're blessed because there's a lot of them here that are up and online that aren't Xers, quote unquote, is as catastrophic as for all of you who have gray hair when we had the generation gap. Remember that garbage? Many people forsook and walked away from the teachings of their family line. We lost whole family histories. We forgot to follow through on something which was, the, which was part of the embodiment of America. Through the verbal lessons of the last generation, we could correct the mistakes before they got too far along. The generation gap of the 60s is identical to the Generation X scenario that's been plugged in now to create an even greater separation from any moral values or guidelines to destroy the foundational works of the Founding Fathers and 
to eventually collapse the country. Now here's the problem, and I said, I, I, am, I have no doubt, if I can't stress anything before I leave today, because we're going to be around for a while still is, we will win. First of all, Daddy didn't train no fool. But it's not going to be cheap. The only reason is because since we let more and more be paid out in the way of human life, and because we let the other side take as much as we have as a people, not just us, as a people, it will take that many more years to correct the problems that have developed. It means that not one of you can retire. I can't stress that enough. I know people that are tired right now. And I said, when will we be able to rest? Or when will we be able to walk away from this? In order for you to ensure that victory that you are going to sustain physically, you are going to have to be directly involved in every aspect of our society to ensure a strong foundation for the next two, three, and four generations. And even then, there's no guarantee. Because there's another crossroads we're going to have to meet here. If we do not finish what we start, if in our tired, if, we, if our bodies tire and our mind grows weary and we somehow accept compromise, ladies and gentlemen, you will guarantee the next generation nothing. Once you are on this path, the issue is attack, attack, attack until the enemy is vanquished, destroyed, brought before the courts of law that are set up, and is properly tried for the crimes that have been committed against the American people. And if nothing else, considering the way our education system is today, because they control it completely, they will not acknowledge that they're the very reason we're where we are today, for 30 years at least, going on 40 or 60, depending on how you count it, the education system has been in the hands of a very small group of people. Illiteracy has gone up, not down. And yet we've spent how much more money on it? As if money is the solution. As if, well, if we pay a mercenary to do it, he's going to do a better job than we are. Oh, I don't have time for government or, or Washington, so let's pay somebody else to go out and do it. That was not the mindset of the Founding Fathers, and it's nothing like what they had in mind for America and for the solutions, the grand experiment that they developed. It's going to take a tremendous effort on our part, and that's where the mindset has to be there also. I expect all of you expect, see I expect something, isn't it amazing? I don't always say this, but I expect something from all of you that most other people won't. We expect you to follow through. I don't mind expending my life, expending our, our breath, going as far as is necessary, and many of these other men and women I know are like this, to try and get you motivated or try to explain to you as a witness what we have seen around the nation. The bottom line to this whole issue is you're not alone. The first question is, why don't we see greater numbers in some cases at events now? Because many people are starting to hold down for the fight. They're not afraid or, or, or cowardly. Their perspective is that we are beyond discussion. Other people are still discovering this issue, so they're willing to go through the rest of the cycle to get to where we are. Now, is this the best position to be? Well, like I said earlier, Daddy didn't train no fool. And to be quite honest, if I wanted to take the position of everybody else, you wouldn't even know who Mark Cronkey was anyway, would you? Because I was trained very well to disappear, and I, I, when the time comes, I can do it. Well, there's certain things, and that's why I brought this book up here, I want you to remember. There was, before Michael knew, there's a woman right over here. The gentleman the, the book's about is John Allen Coey. Before Michael knew, excuse me, before Michael knew, there were other men and women who stood up. The reason I ask you to pick up texts and books like this is because we must show progression. We must show our history. It is not a short event that has only lasted a few weeks or a few months or even a few years with somebody like Mark or John or Paul or Frank or, John or, or JJ or whoever. Ladies and gentlemen, as the entire history and the nature of this history shows, we are simply part of a larger timeline. The mistake that has been made in the past is not properly documenting and recording the events so that once you do pass the flag on to the next generation, they are able to proceed with a working knowledge that they built upon your experience. Well, I can talk to them blue in the face even to my kids, but it's important that we demonstrate the records of what happened and what transpired and the suffering that's taken place so that perhaps for one or two generations beyond what happened this time around, when we go full circle, many people will understand what's, what's taken place and 
gain from the experience. That's hard because there's a, there's a four-letter word attached to that. Does everybody know what it is? W-O-R-K. Work. The New World Order crowd has counted on the fact that people will tire, that people will become exhausted, that frustration will set in, that anxiety will overwhelm ambition. We've got to make sure that doesn't happen, and the only way it's going to take place is the way it's always happened in America, it's always happened in this nation in the past. You know what that is? We have to stand together. If something were to happen to this gentleman right here, not knowing him, and provided the communications works the way it does, and even if it doesn't work properly, or if it's this woman right here, or if it's that man in the back, or if it's that gentleman right there, it makes no difference. We have to stand with these people. And don't expect perfection. If you if you have an issue, or if you, if you don't understand or relate to that, I suggest you go back to the Bible and start reading the verses again. Perfection does not exist with man. It exists with God. We have all made different mistakes. We may also make different judgments that are not fully correct. We'll have to live with that. But there is one thing that we have to all agree and understand on. The enemy we face is all our enemy. All of us. If you attack one of us, you attack all of us. No matter who it be, from the smallest to the, to the quote-unquote greatest, and I might remind you of something, that's not the term that should be used, but simply that person that is the point man for the moment until such time as he falls, and then another person notable will step forward with the banner, pick up the flag, and go another 10 yards, or another 100 yards, or go another mile as needed, until he or she falls, and one of you has to pick it up next. Here's the problem that I have. Any one of you, if you reached inside yourself, could do what all of us that you, that you think are notable have done. You know what the difference is? Accept the idea that you're going to be cut in this fight. Understand that that's part of life. You can't, you can't buffer yourself from it. You can't insulate yourself from it. It is not possible. And if you wish to live fully, and if you want to live free, then you expect to be hurt because you possess a great treasure. If here in your mind you're free, ladies and gentlemen, if this is finally locked into place, no enemy on earth can defeat you, nobody can stand against you, and all who are part of this new world order, a part of what is literally the evil side, the dark side of the force, cannot stand before you. I have seen evil faces, and I, I, there's no other way to describe it, who have wretched, not being trapped, but appearing to be trapped because they've had to face people who know that they're just and right. You're part of that group. One degree or another, you're accepting some responsibility. Oh, I threw that word in again. Responsibility. You're the people that are going to have to execute this mission. The question I have right now, and I've only got moments, is this. If I fall, who will pick up the flag here next? Then with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, in closing, this nation will prevail. It is not a single person. It is all of us combined. It is not one single concept or thought, but the many thoughts of the Republic and our Founding Fathers that is going to be carried on. The next time around, hopefully, we'll have even better tools and better resources, and maybe we can keep the genie in his bottle longer. But the only way that's going to be guaranteed is if all of you become historians, if all of you become speakers, if all of you are as well educated as possible and also as physically capable as possible to protect what you've collected, what you have created, what, you have, what you've embodied, so that it survives to be passed on. The balance. In fact, I am just as quick with a sword as I am with my tongue. I think everybody knows that, if need be. And that's how all of us should be. That's balance. I'm not promoting one specific issue, but the fact that as well-rounded patriots, that's how we're going to march to victory. That's how we're going to bring this nation back up and online. And not me or one individual is going to do it. All of us are going to do it together. That's how it works. Well, in closing, and I appreciate all of you being here, there are three things we do at the end of every session, and I want all of you to join in. How many people know what we're going to do? Well, then everybody else can follow along together. God bless the Republic! Death to the New World Order! We shall prevail! Thank you.
psychological warfare to be, be used again in the United States. I knew that Iraq had been uh, planning some, from some very powerful weapons, weapons like uh, atomic nuclear weapons, atomic bombs, chemical weapons. But Miriam went on to explain to me the fact that Iraq had taken another route. Iraq had taken the biological route, the route of using bacteria as weapons, again, massive weapons, unconventional warfare weapons. And Miriam went on to describe to me in very great detail how the United States was going to be attacked by the Middle Eastern countries with the use of biological weapons. Biological weapons have long been, have been used very limited amounts back through history, but they have never been used except by the Japanese as an all-out offensive weapon. Basically, Miriam has stated that over the last several years, the United States has been helping Iraq build up their defense forces. We equipped Iraq with biological weapons. We sold, like American Type Culture Collection, sold the Iraqis huge quantities of anthrax, bubonic plague, cholera, typhoid fever, just about ever biological known to man. I have been, I have been used to working with, uh, con considering biological warfare, but I consider biological warfare as one nation against another nation using, should we say, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, submarines, maybe off the coast. But I had totally disregarded using uh, as biological weapons being used purely as a terrorist weapon. And the, but this fact had not slipped the Iraqis. Uh, Miriam stated that during the Gulf War, Iraq had a very highly developed germ warfare program, but they did not have bi the biologicals in the continental United States to be used against the United States. And so during the Gulf War, they used only the slow-acting biologicals, the mycoplasma ferminus incognitus, the Gulf War syndrome, which we manufactured at Telex Corporation and Wickcliffe Laboratory, sponsored by the owned by the, Hers uh, the Hercules Corporation out of California, sold huge quantities of these biologicals to the Iraqis. These are slow-acting biologicals, meaning they take months, if not years, to kill you. They used, but they did not use the fast-acting biologicals because they did not want the United States or the coalition force to respond with thermonuclear weapons. Iraq knew that if they used it, we probably would respond. So they did not have the biologicals in the United States at that time. That problem has since been eliminated. And the Iraqis did not have intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver their biologicals. So they used another approach. The little vial that I am holding is actually a germ vial. This is a serum vial that is used to transport biologicals. You simply take the vial this big, they put two milliliters of skim milk, two milliliters of skim water, distilled water, the bacteria. Freeze it, put it to a vacuum pump, put the seal on. With bubonic plague, it's good for stall upwards of 150 years. Anthrax got a little bit longer shelf life, around around 5,000 years. Basically, and the, the Iraq, Miriam stated that she herself, every time that she had returned from Iraq, she was carrying a vial of this in body cavity basically and been smuggling it into the United States. The, and she explained in very great detail, for almost 20 years, the Muslim Sufis, the holy man, had been stating that the great Satan was going to strike the heel of Allah sometime in the 90s. When it struck the heel of Allah, there was, this would set off a Muslim timetable. And this timetable is based upon the Quran. Once this timetable, the third date, had been arrived at, the Muslims will have conquered the world. The, we struck the heel of Allah, by the way, is Kuwait. We struck Kuwait in 91. That started the Muslim time clock from ticking down. And the first date of that attack date is in sometime in July of 97. The next date comes up sometime in 99. The next date comes up sometime 2001. And Miriam described in very great detail how such an attack will be, be carried out. It is very, very simple. The Iraqi ladies have been, uh, the Iraqis had by 1993 had already had 100 cells in the United States. Each cell consists of 11 members. One woman was acts as a carrier 
and also the one who rehydrates the vial, and the ten men. Each, and the way, the way the cell will operate is this. A lady takes a vial. Of, let's say they first start off with bubonic plague. They're going to use a Russian cocktail, which is a mixture of bubonic plague and anthrax. The anthrax takes two days for the symptoms to start showing. Bubonic plague takes three days for the symptoms to start showing. So what you do, the way it operates is this. A lady takes a single little vial this big of, first off, the bubonic plague. She simply goes to the refrigerator, take two, takes two milliliters of skim milk, two mil, milliliters of distilled water, and puts it into the vial. She then takes a 125 milliliter flask this size, puts 100 milliliters of distilled water in it, then adds a nutrient broth powder to this. This is then put on the stove eye, brought to a boil, taken off until it's cool, and cooled to the point you can put it to the inside of your wrist and there is no discomfort. She then takes the vial and pours the vial into this. This is heat put on a heated shaker table, which costs about 50 bucks in the laboratory supply house, dirt cheap, and it's agitated for nine days. About six days after she starts agitating it, she calls each cell member. Each cell member has already purchased three five-gallon stainless steel pump-up sprayers like you use to spray bugs with. They take it, they remove the center pump and set the air pump off to the side. These are then placed on a stove eye. They put four and a half gallons of water in each one of them. They then uh, bring it to a boil. They take a pressure cooker. They put in the pressure cooker uh, three towels. Pressure cook the towels. They to open the pressure cooker, then take the towels, the steaming towels, and place over top the three containers while they're still boiling. This maintains sterility. These are then set off and permitted to return to room temperature. They then take three heating pads like you use for your back. These are placed on the tanks. They bring the temperature up to 35 degrees centigrade. Uh, all 10 cell members do this. Also, the cell members has gone out and purchased from aircraft supply houses a device known as a Venturi. On the side of older airplanes, there's a double funnel shaped device called a Venturi. What it does, it produces vacuum for the suction instruments, the turn and slip indicator, stuff of this nature. They purchase these equipment, and these are either bolted underneath of a car, and they take a tube and run a tube up inside the car, or Miriam said they trained in Cessna 150 aircraft. The aircraft, by the way, that we gave a rock to train with. And they're actually trained on how to not only fly these aircraft, but very quickly steal the aircraft. They simply run onto the field early in the morning, oh, go to the aircraft, open the right engine cowling, reach in with a pair of wire cutters, cut the two magneto kill wires. They then take a screwdriver, pop the door open, untie the airplane, turn on the master switch, hit the primer, hit the starter, fire the engine up, and they take off. They're trained for very, they're trained to get the aircraft in the air as quickly as they possibly can. They've already picked out airfields, or air, not airfields, but farmers' fields around the country. They also chose the Cessna 150s because they're powered with a Continental 100 engine. Those engines will run perfectly off car gasoline, which perfectly frees them from any airports. They also take recording tape, ordinary videotape or recording tape. The recording tape is ground up into a powder and mixed with shellac that is used to paint the aircraft with. What happens when that radar waves strikes that material, it is absorbed into the matrix and is not reflected. So the aircraft becomes invisible to radar. They then take an aircraft, the Venturi, and mount the Venturi out in the right landing gear strut, run a tubing inside the aircraft, take the passenger seat out and throw it away. Now, after about nine days of cooking, the bubonic plague is now at, it, at its peak. The, the lady will take 10, 10 milliliter screw top test tubes like this right here. They'll take a pipette and put 10 milliliters from this into each of the test tubes. She then takes a string, puts a string around the neck of the test tube, goes into the restroom and slides it up into the body cavity. Now, Miriam herself stated, what are they going to do? Talking about the vials, bringing it in. Are they going to have some little room in every airport where they take every lady coming off the airplane in, in and pick up a private of privates? I think not, and she's correct. Also, we, the, our military has already tried with volunteers. Every uh, you, piece of equipment we known to be able to detect these vials carried in body cavity, we cannot. There is nothing can detect it. 
the media that she takes the vial of the bubonic plague. This is delivered to the cell member. Goes into the restroom, recovers the vial, and to the cell member. He opens the vial and pours about three milliliters, about three and a, about three and a third milliliter, into each of the three containers. The lady returns to the apartment and then continues until she has delivered all ten vials. Then she jumps on an airplane and she takes off back to the Middle East. At this, this time, the plague starts. The, the plague starts cooking. They actually take also take three aquarium air stones, heat it in water till it's boiling to sterilize. These are hooked to three aquarium air pumps. And these aquarium air stones are then drop down into the tanks to aerate the bacteria. In the bacteria, the plague starts growing in exponential numbers. Now, about nine, eight days later, the anthrax crew starts. Anthrax grows much faster. Understand, anthrax or plague is fatal at one ten millionth of a gram is fatal. A solution this big is enough to kill 10 million people. But they start the anthrax crews, and anthrax crews do exactly the way the plague crews do, except it takes much quicker. It only takes 12 hours instead of nine days for it to grow up. And they do the same exact procedure with the tanks, aircraft, and everything, and, and exactly with the plague. But now, the plague takes three days for the symptoms once it's released to start showing up. Anthrax takes two days for pulmonary anthrax to show up. Pulmonary plague is 100% fatal. Pulmonary anthrax is 100% fatal. And the way the attack is, once the cells are coordinated on day one, the bubonic plague crews start out. The plague crews will get in their cars, transfer the tanks into their cars, or transfer the air tanks into the aircraft. All they have to do is be driving down the interstate around the city, stuff this nature. The Venturi mounted underneath the car. The air whipping under the car once you get up to 50 miles an hour. Now you got the vacuum inside your Venturi. You open the throttle valve. The throttle valve, you pump up your tank, and the plague starts flowing as a liquid form flows down into the Venturi. Once it hits the Venturi, it turns into a gas, a fog. And they very carefully regulate it so you get four microns and below, which means once you inhale it, it goes very deep into the lung. And if you're following the car at night, you may see a little bit of a vapor trail, six or eight inches coming behind the car. After that, it disappears. And the, now the aircraft crews, what they do, they they got the aircraft stationed around the, around the country. They get in the aircraft with the three tanks. They may have merely, they got a line running out to the Venturi. Start the aircraft up. Let's say at like two or three o'clock in the morning, you don't need much light. All you need is one little spot at the end of the field to point out. Point the aircraft at it, start it up, throw the, throw the throttle to the firewall, get your speed up 55 miles an hour, lift up on the, lift up on the yoke and you're airborne. Turn on the VOR, that's your radio. Listen for the winds aloft. Once you listen to the winds aloft, then you pick out your target. You merely, once you pick out your target, look at your graph, see how far upwind you need to get and at what altitude you need to get due to the wind's wind pattern. Then you open your metering valve. The bubonic plague blows from the tanks out onto the little venturi. From the venturi, you get a fog now coming out behind the aircraft. Understand, these aircraft are now invisible to radar. Even if somebody's seen it, it would be extremely difficult to spot a vapor trail coming off the right, the right landing gear strut. All the aircraft, again, there is no smell, there is no taste, there is no kaboom, there is no bang. The military is working at feverish height to try to find a detector that will detect it. As of right now, we've got a very couple of very crude detectors. And they are they they need would they would give us a maximum of a 15 minute window of opportunity. They said after 15 minutes after the plague is or is released, we cannot detect it. And it only detects it. It does absolutely nothing to kill it once it is released. Now on day one the plague is released. Now on day two the anthrax crews start off. The anthrax crews do exactly the same procedure, but they're releasing the anthrax. What they're doing is creating what is known as a Russian cocktail. Bubonic plague and anthrax release. Remember, bubonic plague takes three days for the symptoms to show up. Anthrax takes two days. So you release them a day apart, so both symptoms show up simultaneously. 
people say, well, what should I do once I start showing the symptoms? Once the symptoms begin, friends of mine who are leading experts in anthrax, Robert Myers with the Michigan Biological Institute, and Johnson with the Pentagon, stated, if somebody come in and starts showing the very, very early symptoms of bubonic plague or anthrax, and we stuck an IV in both legs and both arms, pumped as much heparin, as much serum, and as much antibiotic into the body we possibly might be able to pump into it, we may save an additional one-tenth of one percent of, of individuals. And with and thing about it is, Ann Johnson with the Pentagon, she considers uh, Robert Myers to be an extreme optimist. They say if they did all this procedure, we may save, she says, one hundredth of one percent additional casualties. The fact is, we have had only one single individual in history who has started to develop pulmonary plague ever recovered. One. And we don't know the circumstances by then. Now, the anthrax crews, once the anthrax crews have released their anthrax, they start another little, ta another little task they start doing. The anthrax crews, Miriam showed me a very little simple device that is easily produced from the hardware store. It, it amounts to a rifle-propelled grenade. Miriam stated in the United States, the electricity is generated at 12,000 volts. It's boosted up to over 100,000 volts of electricity for transmission. These transformers are unique. They're one of a kind. They're custom built for each and every power plant. <coughs> They're oil cooled. Being oil cooled, they have on the side of the ra uh, radiators. These radiators are the nation's Achilles heel. All you have to do is fire a rifle grenade into one of those, again, Miriam stated, into one of those radiators. When it strikes the radi radiators, it blows the guts out of them. Very quickly, the oil leaks out and the transformer is either shut down or it burns up. If they drop a single transformer, base load transformer, they can keep the grid up and going. Two, the grid starts to fall. Three transformers, the nation's power grid starts to drop. Three transformers, the nation's power grid collapses. Four transformers, the nation's power grid has collapsed. I was working with the CEO of Montana Power, and he read, with my, he read my book, and I asked him stay, uh, quite candidly, if you lost the transformers, as I described in the book here, how long would it take you to get electricity turned back on? The statement was, if all airline crew are intact, it would take us a minimum of three to four months to get the transformer, to get the electricity turned back on. Last fall, I was debriefed by the military, Department of Defense, national security officials, the whole nine yards. They used voice stress analysis to determine it's a lie detector. The interview went for six hours. After five hours, the lady who was monitoring the voice stress analysis unit got up and had to go to the bathroom to puke. She was turning white as a ghost. She said, the monitor has not moved for five solid hours, a man's telling the truth. We took the information and started feeding the information into the computers. We started running simulation models. What the simulation models showed that if we have 100 cells, we knew in 93 we had 100 cells in the United States. Right now, it's probably two or 300. But if we have 100 cells in the United States, and we, we did a simulation model, the simulation model showed that if we know the day of the attack, if we know the hour of the attack, we are, as we stand right now, we are going to lose 180 million people. If we do not know the day of the attack, we're going to lose 230 million people. With the power company stating it would take three or four months to get the electricity turned back on, if, if we have our line crews intact, if the line crews are not intact, meaning you've got 180 to 200 million people dead, the electricity for the nation could be shut off for many, many years to come. I talk, I'm working with Ann Johnson with the Pentagon. They reviewed my book. They had meetings about three weeks ago all weekend long. They were stating that in the United States today, if they hit a single city, New York City is hit, nowhere else, it would, and with their current medical situation, the way our current medical practice are performed in the United States, it would strip this nation of its entire antibiotic supply, meaning the rest of us would be totally helpless.
basically the only way that we're going to be able to save many people if that we practice strict triage. Triage is that we have basically two groups. Those, essentially those which we give antibiotics to and those we do not. Anybody who is showing any symptoms of plague or anthrax, you give them nothing. Because, essentially, it will waste the antibiotics. The people who, which are showing no symptoms, you provide antibiotics to. My book that I wrote, I show you precisely in very great detail how to defend against germ warfare, how to get the antibiotics, where to get the antibiotics without prescription, how to defend against germ warfare. And based, based on body weight, based entirely upon, it is written in layman's terms. And right now, the military, I was, I was alerted here week before last, that the military has now started diverting domestic supplies of tetracycline to military reserves. Meaning that get your antibiotics and get them now, get them quickly. Because the way, th way things are coming down, it's gonna, it is going to get pretty nasty out there. Basically, I would close with this. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the prophet, thing I think it's 33, says, A people will hire a watchman and put a watchman on the tower. If the watchman sees an army coming and blows the trumpet, and the people hears the trumpet blows, and they do not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes them away, then their blood is upon their own heads. If people heed the warning and they take action, they will spare their lives. I'm a diagnostic microbiologist. The diagnostic microbiologists are the watchmen of the country. We're now blowing the, t the trumpet as loud as we can possibly blow it. The choice is yours. You can act and you can save your lives or you can perish. Either way, my hands are free of your blood. Thank you.